Before we begin, uh, I want to uh, I want to first of all welcome you to remind you, please. M most of the time you're told to turn your cell phones off, but I'm going to ask you to leave them on because I've noticed in synagogue how much joy other people get in disapproving when someone's <laughs> cell phone goes off. And I think it would be churlish and unfair to deprive you of that joy. So please keep your cell phone on so people around you can tzutz and sh wag their finger and whisper how rude you are. I'm telling you, Jews like this. We like this. Our, uh, our program director, Rebecca Small, has been on maternity leave. And uh, before we begin, I want to thank Allison. Allison, in the back, please raise your hand, who's been more than ably substituting for her and has helped put together um, this wonderful night. And obviously, uh, there is tremendous interest. And I also want to personally thank um, the man who first came to me to say, you have to have Yossi at the synagogue, and I'm going to make it uh, possible to have all the advertising that you need. And once the word gets out about this book, you'll see that everybody will want to read it. And having read it myself, all I can say is he was absolutely right, as he almost always is. Um, my friend, uh, David Suisa. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi. I met Yossi uh, 13 years ago, right before he started writing this book. And the journey of my friendship with Yossi has paralleled the journey of him writing this book. And when I say writing this book, when you hold it in your hands after you buy it later, <laughs> and he'll sign it for you. When you hold it in your hands, you'll be holding thousands of hours of hard work that I was a witness to. Because we had hundreds of conversations over the, over the years. And I saw the ebb and flow of the journey of this book. I saw the, the drama, the insecurities, the difficulties, the challenges. Because Yossi would share things with me. And how difficult it was to actually track down these people. And when he would see conflicting narratives. And there was so much hard work that went into this book. And as a writer, an aspiring writer, I can tell you that uh, this is an old school book of hard school or hardcore jur journalism is what I call it. Um, and this is why I think we're privileged to be way to honor this book tonight because it's something that doesn't come often. Um, and people have said that it's the, the true story of Israel. Obviously, I've written about it. Some of you might have read. You might have seen it in the Jewish Journal. We did a cover story on it. They had 1,400 people a few nights ago in New York. And there's a buzz going around the country in the Jewish community about this book. And the reason is because it doesn't just give you one story about Israel. It's very comfortable as our, na as our human nature to just feel one way. You love Israel. We're always trying to feel how, do, how are we going to express our love for Israel. And in this book, there are many different ways of loving Israel. And it's a complicated book, and that's why we're, we love it so much. So it's my great honor to uh, introduce my good friend. And I will tell you also that David's right, because I called David 10 years ago once, and I said, you know, my friend Yossi is in town. And if you know anything about Sinai Temple, they like to plan about a year and a half ahead of time, <laughs> right? So he said, bring him over. And a few days before, and then I brought him over, and he spoke in front of the whole sanctuary. This is a little bit of a second home for me. My kids went to this school, and I've had many events here. We're going to have another event on December 8th. That, uh, th it's a completely different event. I'm going to be debating Peter Beinart. More like, uh, I don't know. Yes, you won't want to miss that. More like WrestleMania kind of thing. Tonight's going <laughs> to be a lot friendlier. But it's, it's truly, I mean, uh, it, it, in fact, this is the opposite of that kind of, of a night because we're going to really celebrate the, the complexity, and I cannot think of a better person to do that than my, uh, my good friend Rabbi Wolpe and my great friend Yossi Klein Alivi. Please welcome him. Okay, I, first of all, I want you to put lots of pieces of paper in here because then it looks like it's been read carefully. Um, 
and and I, I one of the one of the things that makes the book, as as David said, so incredibly rich, is that it tells the history of a nation through the lives of selected individuals, and so you get to know people and also the vast philosophical issues wrapped up in human beings instead of being just words on a page. So the first question, and I heard you uh, in an address to the rabbis at APAC tell this story somewhat. Tell us how you found these people and why you chose these people to write about. Well, uh, thank you, David. And uh, before I, I answer your question, let me first of all thank the two Davids here. And to say that uh, I've waited. here in the back, or did you want to put it as close to your mouth? Yes. Yeah. I've, uh, I've waited many years for this moment. And David and I used to imagine what it would be like if this book is ever completed. <laughs> and, uh, and he promised me we'll do a launch, we'll get Rabbi Wolfie, it'll be great. <laughs> I said, you know, ash, as we say in Hebrew, ashrei hamamin, blessed <laughs> is the one who believes. And uh, so for me, it's, it's really a wonderful night. And uh, I want to thank, thank you, David, Thanks. and you, David, as well, both of you for your friendship and your support. And it's, I'm just thrilled to be here. So um, the, the genesis of this book was uh, during the, uh, the period of the Second, Intif Second Intifada. And that was really, in some ways, I think, the, the low point in Israeli history. We've, and, and that's saying quite a bit, because the, 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 uh, the graph of Israeli, of the emotional graph of Israeli history is very erratic. But uh, the Second Intifada, which brought the war into our, our living room, essentially, brought the, the, the battlefront to the home front, uh, may well have been the, the, low, the low point of, uh, of, of Israeli history. And I was struggling with the question, how did we get to this point from June 1967? Uh, like many of you here, I suspect I came of age in my relationship to Israel in June 67, I was 14, I flew to Israel as soon as the war was over with my father who was a survivor and hadn't seen his two brothers who had survived since the war and they were living in Israel. And so that summer really belonged to the paratroopers. And in a sense, metaphorically, the paratroopers brought me to Israel. I, I fell in love with Israel that summer I always say that summer ruined my life because mm. I, I hopelessly fell in love with an Israel that, that was there and then vanished because that, uh, that was not the happy ever ending of Jewish history as it turned out. So I was looking for, for the, the story. How did we get from there, from the high point, not just of Israeli history, maybe the high point of Jewish history, to, to one of our low points? And... Um, <coughs> when you, so when you first approached, I don't remember which paratrooper it was first, and you discovered how much mm. you had to uh, to learn yet, um, did you envision, first please tell that story, and second, did you envision the vast scope of the book at the beginning, or did it creep up on you gradually as you came along? We discovered when we were talking before, and I've discovered this at the end of your book, that you and I shared an editor. The person who edited my yeah. last book edited yeah. this book. And I know that she would not let you get away with a superfluous word. So, <laughs> I, so I am sure that, you know, the, I, I'm sure that, that it could have been even longer um, given the richness of the stories that are already here. About six months ago, this book was 800 plus pages. Yeah. So you've all been spared that, at least. That sounds 200. like Claire. <laughs> yeah, right. and, uh, my wife uh, Sarah often uh, reminded me during this process that I told her when I began the book, "No problem. This one's going to be a quick one. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to interview a couple of paratroopers. We'll, we'll get the story down and move on to the next project." And uh, I went to interview, uh, I began with uh, a guy named uh, Arik Achmon, who today uh, is 80, and he was the chief intelligence officer of Reservist Paratrooper Brigade 55. And I said to him, tell me something about your life since 1967. And he said, well, in the Yom Kippur War, uh, whose 40th anniversary we're observing now, uh, he said, I, uh, I actually planned the crossing of the Suez Canal 
that moment when the Israeli army regained the offensive, took the war onto the other side. And he said, I was the senior officer the night of that, that crossing. And I said, wait a minute, you're telling me that the same guys who fought in Jerusalem are responsible for Israel's other great mythic victory? And his response was, go home, do your homework, <laughs> and when you, once you know something about us, come back. So I really was learning on the job with right. this book. And <coughs> this, this is anticipating a little bit, but what most surprised you about, the right, about what you discovered in the course of it? Was it an individual or was it a grand theme? It was, um, it was, there were a few themes that, um, that I'd say I, I had an inkling of, but hadn't experienced with the same intensity. And one was the, the central role that the utopian dream has played in Zionism and in Israeli society. And as, as the book evolved, it became something more than what I initially conceived it to be. Initially, I thought the book would be about left and right. Uh, some of the veterans who I write about became leaders of the settlement movement, others became leaders of the peace movement. And I thought, well, that's an interesting story. And then it turned out that there was a far deeper story, which is the, that the two main ideological groups within the paratroopers in 1967 were the secular kibbutzniks, who were at least 50% of, uh, of the brigade, and a much smaller but no less significant group of religious Zionists. And these are the two groups that represented the, the age-old dream of messianism linked to the return to Zion. These are the two movements in Zionism that wanted more than just a safe refuge for the Jewish people, as if that wasn't enough, right. as if that wasn't utopian enough. And they wanted, they imagined that the return to Zion would change the world either through the creation of a uh, socialist utopia, which is really what the early kibbutzniks believed they were creating, uh, or uh, literally through the, the trigger moment of return to Zion, bringing the Messiah to, uh, to humanity. So in, in some ways, the book is <coughs> a story of two different kinds of disappointments. That's, yes, that's exactly right. And the, the question that, that increasingly nagged at me and still does is can we maintain a Jewish state under the conditions of relentless siege without some animating utopian vision? Because these two visions successively defined right. Israel up until relatively recently. Well, uh, is it, I mean, we're going to get into left and right, I'm sure, quite a bit, but um, but it seems as though the right still has, especially the religious right, still has a messianic utopian vision. The settler movement certainly has a messianic utopian vision. The left does not seem to have the socialist utopian vision that once happened. So is it not the case mm -hmm. that, that the, the steam has gone out of one side of the political equation more than the other? I think that's right. I think that's a fair comment. But if, uh, if, if one were to judge the success or failure of these two utopian movements, for me the question is, have they, have they lost the trust of mainstream Israel? Mm. What do, or, do ordinary Israelis, when they look for inspiration, where do they look? And there was a time when Israelis looked toward the kibbutz. The kibbutz was the, right. the, the ultimate vision of Israel. The real, so-called real Israelis were the kibbutznikim. Right. And one of the stories this book tells is the transition from the Israel that was represented by the kibbutz, at least in the world imagination, to the Israel that today is represented by the settlement. Now, that's true, and it's certainly true that, that the settlers retain far greater vitality than, than the kibbutz does. Nevertheless, in terms of, of the trust of the Israeli public, the settlers lost in the almost to the same extent, I would say, as the kibbutzniks did. So can you give us an example of one or two people who show that divergence? I'll tell you two, um, two stories about uh, that are tied into really the, the 40th anniversary, 40th anniversary of the war. And 
One is the story of uh, Hanan Porat, which is a name some of you uh, may know. Hanan Porat was the founder of the first West Bank settlement, Kfar Etzion in the Etzion block. And he was badly wounded in the Yom Kippur War. A mortar shell crashed into his shoulder and amazingly enough bounced, bounced off him and then exploded a little bit in a distance. But that distance was enough to save his life. Uh, his chest filled with shrapnel and he wakes up in a hospital room uh, after a 10 hour operation. The doctor shows him a fistful of, of metal and he said, I've just pulled this from your chest. <laughs> and Hanan is lying in uh, Tel Hashomer Hospital and is trying to make sense of his life. He believes that his, that his survival was miraculous. And he asks himself a religious, the que a question that a religious Jew would ask in such a situation. What does God want from me now? Why has God spared me? And he comes to the conclusion that his job now is to inspire the people of Israel with a new movement of pioneering Zionism. And until 1973, there were very few settlements in the West Bank. There was Kiryat Arba near Hebron. There were, there were a few dots on the map, but by and large, this was a, a very small phenomenon. The settlement movement as we know it today was born in the hospital room of a wounded Israeli paratrooper. And in that room, as, as his friends came on pilgrimage to see him, the idea emerged that we are going to create the next wave of pioneering Zionism, and Gush Emunim, the religious uh, West Bank settlement movement, is born there. So that's one story. The next story is of his friend Avital Geva, kibbutznik, not just a kibbutznik, Hashomer Atzair, those of you who know the, uh, the name, the old Marxist Zionist movement that was so fabrent, so Marxist Zionist, that at one point it was pro-Stalin. And, uh, and Avital is wounded in the, in the Six Day War. Mortar, uh, mortar fragments, nearly blinded. In 73, he's leading a unit that's fighting house to house in Suez City, on the other side of the canal. The last, this is the last battle of the Yom Kippur War. And the last day of the war, they're fighting house to house. They get to the main street of Suez City. 12 noon, ceasefire. Everyone stops shooting. Egyptians on one side of the street, Israelis on the other. And then Avital sees his men starting to walk slowly toward the middle of the street. And the Egyptians are starting to walk toward the middle of the street. They meet halfway, shake hands, and some of them embrace. Avital's immediate response is to protect his men. What if there is an Egyptian who decides to open fire? He pulls his men back but he has seen a possibility of a different Middle East. And when Anwar Sadat lands in, Jer in, in, in Israel four years later, Avital recalls that moment and realizes he has seen a foreshadowing of the Egyptian-Israeli peace. His response is to become one of the founders of peace now. And so two men, paratroopers, both wounded veterans, coming to diametrically opposite conclusions. So as I listen to this, these stories, which are both very moving in their way, and I look out at many of the people here whom I know, um, although some of you aren't members, um, <laughs> and, and we probably have membership forms somewhere, so before you leave, um, yes, right, exactly, next to the exit that will permit you to go. Um, but what I know about many of you seriously who, who come here often and who speak about Israel often is that there are people here who are very firmly on the right and others very firmly on the left. And I think in their arsenal of arguments are two different value sets. On the right, it's history, faith, and distrust. Mm -hmm. That is, this is our land. We've been here for a long time and there's nobody on the other side you can trust anyway. And then on the left, there is um, democracy, demographics, that is, we're gonna lose the demographic war anyway, and empathy, that is, you have to understand the other side. Mm -hmm. 
And I hear the continual reciting <laughs> of these arguments from each side without most of the time any acknowledgement of the validity, even if you don't end up agreeing with it, of the argument on the other side. <laughs> I saw that in the book too. I mean, there are some, like, there are some people in this book who, who have the complexity of the whole mm -hmm. argument, but again and again, you bump up against these polarities, no? The, the arguments in this book are, to some extent, a, um, an expression of the arguments that are happening and have happened for many years inside of me. So that these men are really, and over the years as I've encountered them, they've been arguing inside of me. <laughs> and, and one reason that I, that I wrote this book was to create a unified Israeli narrative that embraces left and right. It's the mm -hmm. same story. And, and my, my response today to, to the divide within, within not just among Israelis, increasingly among American Jews as well, is I really don't care what your politics are about Israel, left or right, as long as when you reach your conclusion, you have the other camp's arguments firmly in your mind. And you need to stand before those arguments and those people and justify your position because it is not simple. And that's what I was hoping to do here. And, and, and I, I showed the book to a friend and uh, someone who was on the left, someone who really never had any empathy for the settlers. And when he finished, he said to me, you know, now, he said, I used to think, why can't Israel just stop building the settlements, shut them down and get on with it? And he said, now, when I, when, I, when I continue to hold that opinion, I'm going to be a little more equivocal. And I felt that was, the great, for me, the greatest success of the book. Um, is it going to be translated? Yeah, it'll be, it'll, uh, it's, the translation into Hebrew is, is it's underway. Yeah. Um, and, and I wonder if you think, OK, so this book lands in Israel. What would you predict the left or the right would have greater readership? Well, the first thing that I'm bracing myself for, for when this comes out in Hebrew is, who do you think you are, an American? <laughs> you think you can write this right. story? You've only been here 32 years, right. you know? And uh, yeah. that's the first thing. The second thing was, were you a paratrooper? Do you know? And uh, so in terms of uh, who will embrace this more, the left or the right, I'm hoping that neither will embrace this as their book. Uh, and that neither will say that, that this book really affirms my argument, or maybe that both will say it. I wonder if you, um, I wonder if you're worried uh, that, uh, because I'm about to do this, um, <laughs> that when people press you on your own view, mm -hmm. that if you say, okay, I, but I think this, that you will then have people retroactively read the book and say, he's prejudiced against this argument, which he doesn't share, really. Mm -hmm. And, and I wonder if there's a temptation for you to say, I have no political opinion whatsoever, I just want you to read the book on its own terms. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give you a, uh, a trade secret of journalists. When, if you ever want to know what journalists really think about a given issue, look at who the person is that they quote at the very end of the article. <laughs> because that is, that is them speaking. And, the, this book ends with one of the uh, seven characters taking his student, I hope I'm not giving away yeah. the, uh, the punchline, and uh, one of, the, one of the, seven, the seven men leading his students right. on a pilgrimage uh, of, the, uh, of the battle, of the scene of the battle for Jerusalem. And he is, was someone who began as a, um, as a messianic uh, theologian, really, of the settlement movement, and ends as very much a, uh, a major figure of the Israeli center, the new Israeli center. And that's, that's where, where my own inclinations firmly are. Well, that also it, it parallels, in part, your journey. You want to say a word about who you were and became? A word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yes, it does parallel my journey. I, I grew up in... Uh, a, uh, a, little, a little town on the prairie called Borough Park in, uh, in Brooklyn. And, um, oh, go ahead. You can applaud for Borough Park. All right. <laughs> you mean the place where if you speak Yiddish, you don't pay taxes, right? That's, That's right. Yeah. And even if you don't speak Yiddish, you don't pay taxes. 
and uh, I, um, I grew up very firmly on the Zionist right, uh, the far right. I, I, uh, I was a teenage follower of Mayor Kahana. I was a teenage werewolf, you know. And um, I, uh, no applause, no, please. You're, tell me you're <laughs> applauding Mayor Kahana. Really, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, all right. I won't be quoting him last, okay? <laughs> That's all I have to say. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just... Uh, right, right. And um, By I, the way, those of, those of you who won't be quoted, there are membership discounts for people <laughs> who are... <laughs> Go ahead. And I, um, I came to Kahana because of uh, my involvement in the Soviet Jewry movement, uh, which I think... Many of you here probably were was was also a formative experience for and um, that uh, that really was um, I'd say my my messianic experience was the Soviet Jewry movement mm -hmm. this the sense of uh, unlimited possibility and if you will it it is no dream and we really saw that happen yeah. in our lifetime and um, and I moved to Israel in 1982 and one of the incidents that I describe in the book was a, a grenade attack on a Peace Now demonstration in 19, early 1983, and uh, Emil Grunzweig, a Peace Now activist, was, uh, was killed in that attack. He happened to, be, to have been a paratrooper as well. And um, I was at that demonstration as a journalist. Uh, I came right after the grenade was thrown. I happened to have been nearby. I heard the grenade, that the grenade had been thrown. I heard about this on the radio and rushed over. And uh, I write in, in, in the book about how journalists came and saw the blood still wet on the pavement. And that was me. I, I saw it there. I saw Grunzweig's blood on the pavement. And it turned out that the attacker was a uh, radical, was someone from the radical right. And that was probably the moment when I emotionally broke with the hard right. I had politically changed over the years. But standing before the blood of, uh, of a, as it turned out, a paratrooper uh, killed by a fellow, a fellow Jew was the moment when I realized these, that, that extremism has lethal consequences when we are sovereign in our own state and, and, and we're on our own. And you almost closed the book with the Rabin assassination. I mean, that's towards the very end of the book. And I it's wondered, as I read that, um, one, something that I wanted to ask you, do you think that there's any single <coughs> event, that is, Rabin hadn't been assassinated, Sharon hadn't had a stroke, something that would have, uh, Israel had made a different initial offer, anything that could have changed in Israeli history that would have led us to a different endpoint than now, or you think, essentially, this is where we were going to end up no matter what? I think there are uh, two fateful moments that, um, that transformed Israel and two moments for which I think we're still paying a high price. Um, one was uh, Sebastia and the other was Oslo, and I'll explain what I mean. Sebastia was the breakthrough moment of uh, the settlement movement when the first Rabin government of the early 1970s uh, gave in and uh, allowed uh, settlers to to uh, move into Samaria, into the Northern West Bank. Until then, the Labor Party had been uh, controlling very tightly where settlements could happen and where they wouldn't. And the Labor Party map was, we'll allow settlements in areas with sparse Arab population, but not in the densely populated Arab areas. After Sebastia, and then of course, when Menachem Begin comes to power, the floodgates open. So the dilemma that we're facing today, and we have a Likud Prime Minister, today, who accepts a two-state solution and knows that we, and has said so publicly, knows that we are going to have to give up some of those settlements and all of the wrenching uh, consequences involved in a possible withdrawal. So that's one, one to my mind, major wrong turn that, that was taken. The other major wrong turn was the Oslo process. Uh, you all know what that was. And I feel somehow that if left and right had been listening to each other's warnings, we might have avoided some of those excesses. We might not be in a position today where we have the, the, uh, the territories filled both with 
hundreds of thousands of settlers, many of whom may have to be moved by the Israeli government on the one hand, and tens of thousands of terrorists on the other who came because of Oslo. So these two, these two very problematic processes, one a process of the right, the other a process of the left, I see as, 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 some, as, as wrong turns whose consequences we're trying to contain uh, to this day. And <clears throat> when you say, just to pursue this for a couple more minutes and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. When you say that Netanyahu um, acknowledges that settlements would have to be removed, um, how, I mean, how do you imagine that happening? We're not talking about a small number and we're not talking about people who are renowned for their flexibility of lifestyle. It's, uh, it's, so well, it's well put. Thank you. I, uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, Netanyahu's formula was that there will be settlements that will remain outside of Israeli sovereignty, which means that what he's trying to do is get the Palestinians to agree to allow settlements to remain in a Palestinian state, which to my mind is, is a nightmare. I think that uh, it, will be, it will be endangering the lives of Jews. I don't see how, in good conscience, we could agree to that kind of an arrangement. Uh, my, my short answer is I don't have a clue right. how we can do that. Right. Uh, the longer answer is that there are various ways of drawing the map. Uh, when we talk about 300,000 settlers, uh, we are not talking about the need to move anywhere near that. Uh, if it will come to that, it will likely be somewhere between 50 to 80,000, which is an enormous number. And moving people, who, who, many of whom were born there. I mean, one of the great successes of the settlement movement is we now have many tens of thousands of native Judeans and Samaritans who feel themselves rightly, rightly, feel themselves as indigenous to, 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 to where they live as any indigenous people anywhere in the world. And how do we do that? This I has happened in know. Beverly Hills over the past gen <laughs> couple generations. There are actually people who were born in Beverly Hills um, and, and refused to be removed. Um, but I, I, I also, the other question that I want to ask actually is about governing in Israel, which obviously we, we can see in our own case how, how problematic democracy can be in America these days. Um, it seems to me that for, for a while now, Israel has been more and more turning to, um, as it was for a long time, an, an effective one-party state uh, for labor. Mm. It seems that way for Likud. I wonder if you see, um, if you see whenever Netanyahu is done, what the future configuration of, of Israeli politics might be. I think the, uh, the great anomaly of, uh, of Israeli politics since the Second Intifada, is that uh, both the, that the, when you look at the 40-year schism between right and left, the victor turned out to be neither. The victor turned out to be the center. And, and beginning with the Second Intifada, you have consistently something like 70% of Israelis telling pollsters that A, we support a Palestinian state and in effect agree with the left about the dangers of occupation, but B, we don't trust the Arab world or the Palestinians and effectively agree with the right about the peace process. And the result of that is that we're stalemated against ourselves. But the, the, to my mind, the, the, the positive expression of the emergence of the center is that we've, we've taken this left-right divide and internalized it into each individual Israeli. And that a centrist Israeli is arguing, we, we have a left-wing side and a right-wing side. And if you were to ask a, a, a centrist Israeli, what do you think of a Palestinian state, you'd likely get two opposite answers from the same person. A Palestinian state is an existential need for Israel and an existential threat to Israel. And so the future of Israeli politics, it seems to me, uh, belongs to that political force or political leader who will be able to articulate the center. Netanyahu is trying to do that, yeah. but he doesn't have his party behind him. The Likud has remained a, an ideologically right-wing 
party, Netanyahu, and Sharon before him. Right. Sharon tried to bring the Likud into the center and had to form his own party. It, it does seem that the prime ministership moderates whoever becomes prime minister away from there. Although I, it's not clear if it did that to Begin, but it's certainly to Sharon and to. Well, don't Begin was Begin was the first prime minister in Israel's David, history no. who uprooted right, settlements. So, so far, the only prime ministers who have ever uprooted settlements are from the Likud. Are, right. Um, the two final questions, and then I'm going to open it up. One is, uh, I, and both are, are somewhat off topic of the book, but they're so urgently, um, they're so urgently uh, uh, immediate to Israel's future that it's hard not to ask them. One is, uh, do you think that Israel would take unilateral action against Iran, and do you have any kind of prognosis of what might happen there, or do you think? that eventually Iran will get a nuclear bomb no matter what noises are made by the rest of the world? Well, I think the, um, one, can, one can say there's good news and bad news. And they're the same news, which is that Israel, I think, is going to stop Iran. And, and um, he said, I, think, we'll that he said, I we'll think that Israel will stop Iran, or at least. I said it quietly because it's a secret. Right, yeah. So, right. Um, <laughs> exactly. Only you, by the way, please, <laughs> please. Just like when you go to Israel and you get those briefings, this is only for you. I wouldn't say this to anyone else. Please, go That's ahead. That's right. Uh, I think that what, um, what solidified, my sense is that there is now a majority in the Israeli cabinet for, an, for a strike, and that what solidified that majority was uh, President Obama's abysmal conduct during the Syria crisis. That was gonna be my next question. And um, <laughs> let's, 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 not, let's not applaud or, 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 or de-applaud, or let's really, it's, it's the, the issues I think are too, are too serious for, uh, for that kind of uh, response. And, and, and the, the sense in Israel, even among those who feel that, that the deal with Russia might turn out to be halfway right. bearable. The way in which Obama reached that deal was so humiliating for the United States most of all, for the projection of American credibility in the Middle East, that the conclusion reached not only in Israel, but in the Arab world as well, is that everything that we feared about the indecisiveness of this president uh, turned out to be true and, and more. And, and, you know, in, um, in Obama's first term, the urgent question in Israel, and, and within the Jewish community here as well, was, is he a friend or not? And I think that, I always felt that was the wrong question, because frankly, it doesn't matter if he's a friend or not. Eisenhower was personally very warm toward Israel, but his policies were not friendly. Uh, Bush was, Bush father was not warm toward Israel, but by and large, was, uh, was his policies were quite good to Israel. And, and when Obama came to, uh, to Israel in March, he really won the hearts of the Israeli public. He said all the right things in all the right places. He affirmed, no, no, but in a very, seri in a very serious way. He affirmed Israeli, the Israeli narrative. He affirmed our fears, our historical legitimacy. All of the complaints that we had about Obama in the first term, he really tried to rectify. The question, today for Israelis, and, and again, I think this is the, the only question that really matters, is can we trust this president's resolve? And when he says he's got a red line, as he said on, that he has on Iran, can we trust him? And my answer today is, 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 is unequivocal. Hey, unequivocally, no. Right. Yes. That's <coughs> I see you're leaning left. <laughs> I'll repeat the question, but just make it quick. The one thing that's been missing is. Okay. Oh, well, no, no, don't give a narrative. What's the question? Yes. Do you think that Trump has occupied 
Okay, when are we going to stop using the enemy's term and stop calling? Okay, all right, and stop calling it occupied territory. And did God have a part in the '67 and '73 war? Um, I believe that God has a part in 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 everything. In in my life, I believe God speaks to me on a regular basis, but He also speaks to all of you. Uh, we just need to learn the language. And uh, of course, of course, God was in uh, the '67 war. But I I have to say. That if we say that, and I do believe that, then God was in the Holocaust as well. That's our dilemma. So let's, let's not turn God into a political slogan, because God's a complicated business. And so that's, that's the first, that's my first response. And, um, and it's interesting because uh, I, I'd say that I am a religious Jew today uh, in part because of the Six Day War. When I stood at the wall with my father, uh, in the summer of 67, I saw him become a religious Jew. He had lost his faith after the Shoah. And, he, and what he said to me that summer was, now I forgive God. So it's a very, really, we're talking about a, a very complicated process. Uh, in terms of occupied territory, I don't use the term occupied territory. I do use the word occupation. When I say occupation, I mean the occupation of the Palestinians who are undeniably being occupied. I, I do not feel, I do not feel that I am an occupier in Judea and Samaria. I don't feel that. I don't feel that I'm an occupier in Hebron. I feel far more indigenous and rooted when I go to Hebron than I do in Tel Aviv, for that, for that matter. Having said that, the tragedy of this conflict is that there are two peoples each of whom contests the same little piece of land from the river to the sea. Each side can make a compelling argument based on their own narrative about why the totality of the land belongs to them. Now, I have no qualms about saying, Kula Shali, it's all mine. And I think one of the major mistakes of the Israeli left was to emotionally withdraw from Judea and Samaria. We may well have to withdraw physically, but if we do withdraw physically, we will be giving up something that belongs to us. And that's why I believe that only the Likud, uh, really <laughs> the old slogan, only the Likud can, Raka Likud Yachol, only yeah. a leader who believes that the land belongs to us will be able, will have, the, will have the validity to withdraw from parts of the land in the same way that if there will be a, a two-state solution, Elohim Gadol, as we say in the Middle East. God is great, and who knows? But if there will be a two-state solution, each side is going to have to give up something that it feels essential belongs to its patrimony. That, in, in, if you think of it that way, then there is nothing more cruel than a two-state solution. Because a two-state solution is, is, his, is historically an act of injustice. It, is, it will be an act of injustice for me to be deprived of Judea and Samaria. Just as Palestinians will feel it is an act of historical injustice for them to be deprived of Jaffa and Haifa. If there ever is going to be an end to this pathological war, that's the move that has to happen. Whether it can happen, whether it will happen, I don't know. But again, the only way that we will ever reach peace is from a place of insisting that this all belongs to us. Yeah. Yeah, about the Kerry negotiations, which, which I don't know, I, I mean, is there anybody who is optimistic about this on either side? No, that's the short answer. <laughs> Hi, Greg. <laughs> uh, the, you know, it's, it's, there, there's a, a tragedy here that we're witnessing because uh, in, in, in a sense, I think that Netanyahu and perhaps Abbas both are capable of reaching an interim agreement, but not of reaching a final agreement uh, for all kinds of reasons. Abbas is incapable of delivering the Palestinian people on the final status deal over right of return. And, uh, and I don't think Netanyahu can redivide Jerusalem. And I also don't think that circumstances are right for a final status agreement. If we were to create a Palestinian state today and move, and move back 
to approximately the green line, we would risk creating one more failed Arab state. And when you look around the region, we now know what failed Arab states look like. And we can't have that five minutes away from Tel Aviv. So it's premature to make that move. Nevertheless, I think that there are interim stages that could be reached. And I think that Netanyahu, for one, would very much want, want to make that, that deal. But both men, for various reasons, can't do that politically. They would both need to reach a comprehensive agreement, which, to my mind, again, is, 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 is impossible. How serious is the internal divide in Israel? Not left and right, but dati and lo dati, the religious secular divide in your mind sociologically. Look, the religious secular divide is, is really the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox, non-ultra-Orthodox divide. Right. And, and we saw that play out in, in the coalition agreement where, where Yesh Atid, uh, the new party of Yair, of Yair Lapid, made common cause with the National Religious Party, now known as uh, Bayit Ayudi, of, uh, of Naftali Bennett. So that the religious Zionist world is very much part of the Israeli mainstream. The Haredim are completely alone. This was the major shock for the, for the Haredi society. So this, this idea that we have of, of an Israeli society bitterly divided between religious and secular, I don't think it was ever true, and it certainly isn't true today. And it isn't true for two reasons. One is because on the Orthodox side, you really have large numbers of, of, of moderate Orthodox Israelis for whom being part of mainstream Israel is central to their identity. And among secular Israelis, so-called secular Israelis, you have growing numbers of what I would call post-secular, who deeply want to connect to their, to their Jewishness, not in an orthodox way. They're looking for, for an indigenous Israeli non-orthodox expression of Judaism. And we're seeing this beginning to spread. And, and if I could just say one, one more point about this, because I, I think this is a crucial misperception that's spreading in the American Jewish community. There's a growing narrative, certainly among liberal American Jews, that Israel is becoming more right-wing and more fundamentalist. The opposite is happening. Yet the rise of Yesh Atid is the first party in the history of Israel to represent a cultural and, and, and religious spectrum ranging from, you have an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, Dov Lipman, right. you have a religious Zionist, uh, Shai, Por Shai Porat, who's now the, uh, the education minister, Shai Porat is the education minister, you have, you have Ruth Calderon, who represents the new generation of non-Orthodox, religiously-minded Israelis, and Yair Lapid, more to the secular side. There has never been so culturally nuanced a party. And I think the future belongs really to, to, to that movement, whether literally to that party or not, I don't know. But Israelis want not just a political center to help us get through the Palestinian problem, but they also want a cultural center to help us get over the, the animosity of religious and secular. Um, I'm gonna pause here for two seconds for an advertisement. November 15th, we're having a Friday night dinner. Um, with APAC and David Horowitz of the Times of Israel will be here and we'll be in dialogue with David Horowitz. There are flyers outside and I hope you will join us for that as well. Uh, yes. If you really mean freely, then uh, the question is, uh, do you accept the possibility that most Palestinians, like most Israelis, want to stay in their homes, want to stay where they are? So um, 
Yes, uh, there were pal there were many tens of thousands of Palestinians working in the Gulf states in Kuwait uh, before the first Gulf War, and then they had to come back to the territories. Uh, the um, I think that that none of us know what's going to happen. The Middle East is convulsing now. Really, anything can happen, and God forbid there were all kinds of apocalyptic scenarios that one can envision. But um, the notion of, of large numbers of Palestinians leaving the territories uh, is something that would probably happen uh, under conditions that would be so horrific that whatever blessing you would anticipate from that would be heavily outweighed by, by the, c the conditions that would create that. Go ahead. Sir? Right, George Packer. George Packer wrote this mm -hmm. piece about this guy, and and basically that Iran is the source of not all evil in the Middle East. Let's conservatively say ninety percent. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> look, the um, if you look at the uh, the civil war in Syria, I mean, it's it's it it is a an excruciating dilemma to try to uh, to think of which side should should prevail. Uh, Nevertheless, uh, in the end of the day, I feel that, uh, we're, we're, that we need to see the fall of Assad because anything that weakens Iran uh, is, um, is, 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 a, uh, is a blessing, e even if it's a hard blessing given who would come to power in Syria. The, um, you know, I think that what we're seeing in Syria to some extent is, uh, is, is a, a replay in, in very different forms of the Spanish Civil War, where you had a proxy war of two, two, two totalitarian movements. You had Stalinism and Nazism fighting in Spain. And we're seeing something similar happening in terms of a, uh, of a uh, jihadist civil war between the Shiite jihadists and the, and the Sunni jihadists. And the immediate goal needs to be to substantially weaken the Shiite jihad. Uh, to my mind, primarily because of the, the, imminent, uh, the imminent nuclearization of Iran. And uh, on that issue, I am uh, very hawkish. And I, I, I've always been, I haven't changed my position on this for a moment. And I, when Netanyahu stands before the UN and says Israel is prepared to go it alone, I, I believe him. I think he, he's, I think, I think he is telling us in as clear a way as possible right. that this is something we're going to do if, uh, if the international community allows itself to be duped uh, into believing that there are relative moderates in this Iranian regime. Yeah. Right, whether they're capable of it is obviously a, yeah, an interesting question, but yeah, Tom? It's a great question. Great question. Did I, do I need to repeat it? Yeah, he, uh, go ahead. You want to repeat? No. The, the question no. was, um, he said, look, about the role of memory in writing this book, you're interviewing people who 
experienced this 40 or 50 years ago, did they have conflicting memories with each other? Were there things they didn't remember? And did their memories sometimes conflict with Yossi's individual research, things that he learned? I did, uh, I, I certainly encountered, I'd say even repeatedly so, uh, conflicting narratives of the same incident. Uh, sometimes the same person over a period of 11 years changed uh, his narrative. Uh, and I also encountered uh, people who tried to insert themselves into the narrative in ways that I knew from my research was simply not possible. Right. And, and I, uh, was at, I was at the wall when it was liberated. I was at the wall. Yes. Someone, <laughs> in fact, someone just told me the other day, you know, I... I, I ran into this guy who told me he had been, he was, he liberated the wall and he said, there was so much garbage at the wall we just had to wade through. Well, he was at a different wall. No. <laughs> Maybe, it might have been possible, it was the next wall. <laughs> so uh, the, um, w and, and you know when, um, my, my training is as a journalist and not, a, not as an historian, so I had a lot of, a lot of on the job training to do here. And, what I, what I came to realize is that, is that one, one way in which, in which to verify different versions was to go back and ask the same person a couple years later, and unfortunately I had many years in which to do this, <laughs> uh, is, was, um, well, tell me that story again. What happened? And if the details were reasonably consistent, then I felt I could, I could go with it. And um, I also, I, 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 I had the benefit of, um, of, of dealing with seven men. I chose seven paratroopers, all of whom are, are or were very public figures in Israel in various fields, uh, from politics to economics uh, to the arts. One of, my, uh, one of my main characters, Mayor Ariel, was, um, was our Bob Dylan. And he was a paratrooper in 67. And he transformed Israeli music. And unfortunately, Mayer died before I, uh, I began this book. But he left behind such a rich record of interviews beginning in the summer of 67. Mayer's first, Mayer's first hit was a song called Yerushalayim Shel Barzel, Jerusalem of Iron, which he wrote in the middle of the battle for Jerusalem, and it was his response to Nomi Shemez Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, and it was a fighter's response to what he felt was a, 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 um, a prettification of Jerusalem. This was, this, was, this was a cry of a soldier writing about Yerushalayim Shel Barzel. And, and so I, 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 had, I had a very extensive archive of, uh, of interviews of, of all of these men over the years, over decades, and I was able to compare what they said in real time about their experiences to, uh, to what they were telling me now in, in their older years. You need to hear the question. Does the IDF still play the central role that it used to in terms of absorbing young people into a, a, a single Israeli identity and motivating them? Uh, more than ever, uh, if you, um, let's, let's take the Russian immigration as an example. The Russian immigration was, I'd say the Russian immigration and the Ethiopian immigration, which came at roughly the same time. Uh, were each, in, in their way, the, the most difficult uh, Im immigration to absorb into, into modern Israel. Uh, the, the Ethiopians came deeply Jewish, but uh, totally cut off from the modern world. Uh, the Russians came very much a part of the modern world, but the least Jewish immigration in Israel's history. Uh, and if you look at uh, the, the relative success of, uh, of bringing in large numbers of young Ethiopian Jews, uh, not only into, into good units in the army, but also into the officers' corps. I think that's one expression. In terms of the, uh, the Russians, there's a, a tremendous program that the army 
has been uh, undertaking for the last years, uh, which is to convert Russian recruits to Judaism. It offers that option. Any young Russian, young man or young woman who is serving in the IDF and wants to convert to Judaism is given a, a, a fast track into, into conversion. Now, if, if, if you were to try to do that in, with any other institution, given the control that the chief rabbinate has today, it wouldn't be possible. The only institution in Israeli society that's stronger than the coercion of, of the chief rabbinate is the army. And the army has taken on itself the role to break the monopoly of the chief rabbinate on conversion. Every year the army converts something like a thousand young Russians. Are you going, are you, I'm gonna step on the applause for the Israeli army. Um, are you gonna be taking this book to Europe? Will you be doing a tour there? Oh, wow. I, uh, I hope not. <laughs> I, well, that's, that's what I wanted to ask. What I wanted to ask was this. Um, something that occurred to me, you know, it, it's, uh, there, the, the contrast between the 67 and the 73 war are interesting in lots of ways. I mean, one of the things that you realize in reading this book is that the 67 war is won by the generals and the 73 war by the soldiers. That's right? Exactly the generals right. Were, were... It's a really wonderful way to put it. In, Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, but, so to speak. Uh, that's a non-European <laughs> term. But one of the things that also occurred to me was after the 67 war, there was tremendous sympathy for Israel in Europe. Mm -hmm. After the 73 war, I mean, we know it got worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. So do you think there was just a latent anti-Semitism that was held back? Or do you think that the situation that Israel both found itself in and created actually fostered the hostility of many European nations. Well, you know, Europe is is carrying two humps on its back. One is is the Shoah and two thousand years of anti-Semitism. The other is centuries of colonialism. Right. And it was very convenient for many Europeans. And and I think this is pl being played out uh, on a on a on an unconscious level uh, to to identify Israel as colonialist and in doing so, freeing itself of both of those burdens. Because if you, if you condemn Israel for colonialism, you are atoning for your own history of colonialism. And in some way, what you're really saying to the Jews is, get off your high horse. As soon as you had power, you turned around and did the same thing, right. the same thing. And you hear that language, the same thing. And, and so I think that that's a combination of, of, of many factors, psychological factors. But I think that when we speak of Europe's relationship with Israel, one needs to speak more in, in psychological terms than political terms, and, uh, and psychopathological uh, terms. And, and Europe is desperate to free itself from these two burdens of guilt. Uh, and, and it converges on the West Bank settlements, which is one reason why I think they are so uh, extreme and his hysterical about the settlements. And lastly, um, to close, before we're going to have a chance, and a Allison is going to walk is going to walk Yossi over to the table. So please don't ask him questions on the way, so he can get there, and you can buy his book and ask him questions as he signs it. Um, lastly, you have in this room, as you certainly had in New York and so on many, many, many people who are extremely active in Israel-related issues, as we'll call you an Israeli, even if, you know, <laughs> the paratroopers will give you a hard time. What is it that American Jewry can do, should do, isn't doing, might do, that would be better for Israel? I mean, what, what advice do you have for us? To pay more close attention to the real Israel. And this is true, I think, for, um, for American Jews uh, on the left and the right. Uh, there tends to be either an idealized Israel or the opposite, a, um, a, fa a failed or failing Israel. And uh, David and I were having this conversation today and said, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that many American Jews fell in love with Israel in the 50s and 60s but didn't know Israel. Uh, and, uh, and many American Jews today are falling out of love with Israel, and they don't know Israel today either. 
And, um, and, and so my, my plea would be to, to get to know the real Israel. And what I, what I actually tried to do in this book was give something of the real Israel back to, to, my, to my community, to the community that I grew up in. And, and I, I, I often felt, David, you know, when, when, when I moved to Israel and, and, and being a journalist, writing primarily for an American Jewish audience these last 30 years, I felt that I was a, a, a kind of spy sent by the American Jewish community, spy out the land and tell us who those strange people are over there <laughs> that are doing all of these extraordinary things. And, and, and I've tried over the years to, to report back to my, to my, to my home team and, uh, and explain to American Jews what, it was what, what it's like over there. And this book is really, I'd say, an attempt to, to explain what happened in Israel from May 1967, uh, more or less until now, what the texture felt like. And if I could say just last one Please. point about Absolutely. this, which is that um, a writer has to ask himself at a certain point, who did you write this book for? Who, who is your ideal reader? And I realized not so long ago that uh, my ideal reader was me if I hadn't made Aliyah. Someone who is obsessed with Israel, who lives vicariously through Israel, who, who rejoices with when Israel rejoices, who mourns when Israel mourns, knows the general outline of the story of the last 40 years, but doesn't know the texture, doesn't know what, it, what, what did it actually feel like, what did it sound like. And this really is an attempt to, to give us back something of our story before it disappears into, into history. It is not only an interesting book and a book that introduces you to some remarkable personalities, but it is really a beautiful book. And I hope not only that you will buy it, but uh, even more that you will read it. And we thank uh, David Suiza for bringing us the wonderful Yossi Klein Halevi. Thank you, David. Thank you.